Uh, so our first uh, presenter is Robin Carsten, and uh, I'm um, very excited to welcome Robin. She's a professor of linguistics at University College London, and she's most well known for her research on pragmatic phenomena within the relevant theoretic framework. She's interested uh, in the role of context-sensitive pragmatic processes, and one of her core interests involve metaphor, but also other figurative uses of language, as well as the formation of ad hoc concepts. As we have already heard yesterday, IRA has been instrumental in bringing people from different fields together and introducing them to experimental pragmatics. And in the early days of XPRAC, uh, that actually meant to visit the CNRS in Lyon and uh, visit IRA to talk about experimental pragmatics. And Robin as well spent a few months at IRA's lab in Lyon way back in 2004, which she says was her very first acquaintance with experimental pragmatics. In the meantime, Robin is a regular at XPRAC events and has supervised numerous exciting PhD projects with an um, emphasis on experimental pragmatic phenomena and questions. And uh, so I'm very happy to welcome you, Robin, and the screen is yours. Please share your screen with us. Okay. Um... Uh, I'm now trying to try to get the slideshow. Yeah, okay, that's working. So uh, thank you very much, Petra, for that <clears throat> very warm and generous introduction. Um, I, I want to say that I was really very happy to be invited to take part in this symposium to honor Ira um, and the important work that he did 20 years ago, and of course since then, but that work 20 years ago, which played such a big role in uh, launching what was the new sub-discipline of experimental pragmatics and the various XPRAG networks, <clears throat> which have led to such a flowering of empirical work in pragmatics and semantics. So very many thanks to Valentina and Filippo for organizing the meeting and for inviting me. Um, when it comes to uh, something Valentina mentioned yesterday, outsiders and insiders, well, I definitely feel that I'm in the outsider camp, but I've done a lot of peering over the fence during the last 20 years, watching the insiders working away, learning a great deal, and in fact, using a lot of their findings in my own work. As Petra said, I was fortunate enough to spend some months back in 2004, I think it was, at the Institute of Cognitive Sciences in Lyon with uh, Ira as my host, a very gracious host, as you would expect. Um, we had a regular reading group discussing all sorts of theoretical and empirical papers, um, and we had lots of uh, probably even more interesting uh, informal chats over the coffee machine, as it was then, and staring into the wonderful carp pond. In fact, that as I um, said to Petra privately, this was the first time I'd, I heard of the N400. Uh, Ira was very excited about the N400 back then and was talking about it a lot. It was entirely new to me. And of course, now it's become entirely commonplace and very, really quite central to a lot of work in uh, experimental pragmatics. So the title of my talk, as you can see, um, I'm just going to try and remove some stuff which is blocking my view, but okay. Um, the title of my talk is Metaphor Referring and Predicating Costs and Benefits. So it's just a slight adaptation really of um, the title of the paper by Ira and his colleagues, which is um, the, the point of departure, the, the kicking off point for all of today's talks. I want to say a couple of preliminary things before I get going. Um, one is that, uh, at least initially in the talk, I'm actually going to be looking at the 20 years, uh, ra rather than looking at the 20 years that followed um, Iris talk, I'm going to be looking backwards at a lot of work on metaphor, which was done prior uh, to the Novak et al paper, which their paper is a kind of reaction to. I don't know whether this is a function of my age and stage of life that I'm looking backwards, but um, I will do a little bit of looking forwards as well, I hope. Um, and the second thing to say is that I remember when I first read the paper back in 2001, I was intrigued by the metaphor stimuli that 
they used in their experiments because they seemed a bit unusual to me. Um, and that feeling kind of has kind of lingered in my mind ever since, but it's really only in the past few weeks when I've been thinking about this talk, rereading the paper, thinking about the talk in the symposium, that I really started trying to come to grips with the issue. Um, and in fact, I was extraordinarily inspired to design an experiment of my own, the results of which um, I'm going to present today. And, uh, you know, these are very much hot off the press. It was only a couple of days ago that um, uh, we managed to put them together due and ent almost entirely to the extraordinary hard work of one of my PhD students, Jin Jin Yan. Um, uh, without her commitment, um, I'm afraid I wouldn't have been able to, to get there. So uh, it's been a new experience um, designing this experiment, a lots of effort, um, but as when we expend effort, uh, there have been considerable rewards as well. So let me get going. Um, <clears throat> so the paper by Ira and his colleagues, Maurice Bianco and Alain Castri, uh, was one of the first experimental papers, as far as I know, using the relevance theory framework or you, and using that framework as a kind of source of hypotheses to be tested. So one of the things that the framework uh, appears to say is that other things being equal, and that's important, extra costs, extra processing costs will lead to extra benefits or effects, cognitive effects. Um, and in fact, in the early part of their paper, Novak et al, I'm going to say Novak et al, so I'm not just saying Ira, um, even though it seems a bit unfriendly, Novak et al argue from the fact that metaphors generally give extra benefits, um, that they give uh, non-propositional effects, that they give um, one, one a sense of affect and attitude, as well as implicatures, that from those extra benefits, we should expect that metaphors would take extra effort, extra costs, to understand. So the hypothesis of that paper is that metaphors are costly when compared with literal controls. And so in the experiment that I'm just gonna focus on, there was, a, there was an earlier one, but in their experiment too, which was the online experiment, a self-paced reading task was involved. Um, the sort of stimuli they used are roughly indicated here. So there'd be a context story presented to the participants or subjects, as we called them back then, um, a story like the following. So here's a group of second grade pupils at a swimming pool playing games and swimming laps up and down the pool. And at a certain point, the lifeguard cries out one of the following, all toads to the side of the pool metaphorical case, or all students to the side of the pool, the equivalent literal case. And they tested adults and um, children aged 9, 11, and 14. The results, summarizing swiftly, um, reading speeds increased with age. So th this was a developmental study, and that aspect of it is not something I'm going to be discussing here. I'm sure Nausicaa will pick up on that in her talk. Um, but the result that I'm interested in here is the following. At each age, sentences containing the metaphorical reference are read consistently more slowly than those containing the synonymous, that is, the literally used, control sentences. And although the gap closes with age, it never closes completely. The adult data confirm that metaphorical reference prompts a slowdown when compared to synonymous controls. Okay, so, um, so metaphorically used phrases seem to take significantly longer to process than corresponding literally used phrases across all ages. And this appeared to be in disagreement with statements made by Ray Gibbs in his book, The Poetics of Mind. So um, here's just a scatter, a bunch of scattered quotes from uh, that book. The results of the extensive empirical investigations reviewed in this chapter do not support hypotheses by linguists, philosophers, and literary theorists who specifically contend that figurative language is special and always demands extra work to be interpreted. The psycholinguistic research indicates that people can understand many instances of figurative expression effortlessly. In general, novel, 
that was important, novel figurative speech takes no longer to produce or interpret than either literal or cliched figurative output. Okay, so uh, there seems to be a clear disagreement here. Now going back a bit, 90, the 1980s and the 1990s, as I said, I'd be going back, um, a central issue for metaphor processing, uh, for, for studies of metaphor processing were, was to test the so-called three-stage model, also known as the literal first or the maxim flouting model, which had been formulated um, based on these philosophical accounts by Grice and Searle, these philosophical rational reconstructions, to test that account, that model, as against direct access models. I'm sure this is very familiar to everybody, so I'm going to just zip through it very quickly. Uh, according to the literal first model, there are these three stages. First, you have to access a literal interpretation. Second, um, the literal interpretation is found to be defective, to flout a maxim, in Grice, as Grice, Grice puts it. Uh, and so you abandon it and you have to search for another interpretation, the non-literal interpretation, um, which uh, is embodied as an implicature or a bunch of implicatures. So this would seem to entail that there's more processing effort involved in comprehending a metaphor than for comprehending a corresponding literal use. And that's as against the direct access view, um, according to which, I'll miss out the bracket here, according to which processing metaphorical uses need be no more costly than processing literal equivalents. Okay, well, the results of these of those studies in the 80s and 90s, generally speaking, favored the direct access view, um, namely that deriving a, relevance, a relevant metaphorical interpretation need not take more time or effort than deriving a relevant literal interpretation. And I've listed a bunch of the big names from back then, very recognizable to everybody, I'm sure, or Tony Gehrig, Gibbs, Glucksburg, um, et cetera, et cetera. All of them essentially got this result using a wide range of tasks and measures and stimuli and types of context and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to focus on um, some of the metaphor, a metaphor stimuli that were used. Um, so there was one bunch of experiments that used metaphor stimuli that had no meaningful literal interpretation. So things like her marriage was an icebox. That doesn't have a sort of sensible literal interpretation or his cat was a princess. And they would compare these with uh, literal equivalents such as for her marriage was an icebox, her marriage was disastrous. Her, his cat was a princess, his cat was very fussy and so on. And the preceding context uh, for these would be kept fixed. The conclusion from one of the experimentalists who used these kind of stimuli then was, well, when the context provides sufficient information, metaphor comprehension occurs as quickly as literal sentence comprehension. The evidence, or the priming evidence in their case, suggests that comprehension processes that integrate a sentence with the preceding context for both metaphorical and literal materials may be very similar. Uh, <clears throat> now, it could be argued, I suppose, that the absence of any sensical literal interpretation of the metaphor sentences and in some sort of sense necessitates a metaphorical interpretation. However, as the next slide shows, even when there is, is a coherent literal sentence meaning, the metaphorical interpretation seems to be easily accessed when in an appropriate context. So Gehrig uh, did things this way. He used the same sentence, in this case, in this example, the winter wind gently tossed the lacy blanket, which has uh, a literal interpretation and a metaphorical interpretation. And he tested uh, the accessing of these interpretations uh, in different contexts, one of which was literally, literally biased, literal, literal interpretation inducing, and the other of which was metaphor inducing. So Joan didn't want to put her silk blanket in her automatic dryer, although it was January, she risked putting it on the clothesline. The winter wind gently tossed the lacy blanket. 
as opposed to Joan looked out into her yard with great excitement. Overnight, a layer of snow had covered the ground. The winter wind gently tossed the lacy blanket. Garrick found that participants took no longer to read and understand the final sentence in B, the meta, in B, the metaphorical lacy blanket, then they took to read and understand the same sentence in A, the literal lacy blanket. And Ortoni and others found exactly the same thing. Inhoff et al. conclude, with sufficient contextual support, metaphors are comprehended as efficiently as literals. So even when the metaphorical metaphorical, the sentence to be interpreted metaphorically does have a coherent literal interpretation, we get no literal interference effect. Okay, so this all seemed pretty strong evidence in favor of metaphorical language not imposing any special processing effort. And the, uh, of course, the Novak et al. results seem to indicate something quite else, as in fact do some um, results from Gibbs 1990, which uh, Ira and his group were basing their work on, or at least um, you, they used the same paradigm. So both of them found that participants in their online self-paced reading tasks took significantly longer to comprehend the metaphorical stimuli than the corresponding literal stimuli. However, but as Gibbs 1994 notes, both of them were using metaphorical cases which were referential. All their metaphorical stimuli were referential. So just to make sure, absolutely sure, sorry, being a bit school teacherly here, that the uh, distinction is clear. Um, consider the following little scenario, same sort of swimming pool scenario as before. Some young children are taking swimming lessons. They've been practicing for a long time. They're getting tired. The instructor is pleased with their progress and he says one of the following. The tadpoles can get out of the pool now. That's a referential expression. The metaphor there, the tadpoles, refers to the children. In B, he, might, he, he could say instead, you kids are doing great, you are tadpoles. That would be the predicate case. Now, <clears throat> but it seems to me that the vast bulk of empirical studies of metaphor processing, especially those that were testing the two models, the literal first and the direct access, used predicate metaphors, things of the form X is a metaphorical Y, X is or R metaphorical Ys. Why did they do this? Well, maybe they were following Grice and Searle and the other philosophers who discussed examples like you are the cream in my coffee, Sally is a block of ice, Juliet is the sun, all predicate cases. But I think there's also a very strong intuition, at least there's one I have, and which was what raised this question mark in my mind when I first read uh, Ira's paper, um, a strong intuition about metaphorical uses that the predicate uses us are much more frequent. Now, of course, this needs to be checked. I don't know whether it ever has been checked, perhaps via a corpus study, and it raises all sorts of questions if it's, if it's correct. Why should they be much more used um, predicatively than referentially? Is it something about the nature of metaphor, which of course, as a sort of theorist of metaphor is perhaps what primarily interests me. Um, and by way of contrast, and this is a little bit of an aside, um, this does not seem to be the case on the surface at least with metonymy. So cases like the ham sandwich, the appendicitis in Ward 4, um, which I think appear in quite a lot of uh, experimental literature now, especially Petra's work. Um, these referential uses seem relatively common, relatively natural, and maybe predicate autonomy cases are a bit harder to come by. So if we consider something like John is a ham sandwich, it might be okay in the right sort of context, but it doesn't seem to me to be the kind of thing that occurs with the frequency of the referential cases. So if this is right, and this is just sort of hunches on my part at the moment, it could tell us something interesting about these two different kinds of 
figurative language use. And I put in a hopeful little bracket here, I'll return to this issue later. I know I'm not going to have time to. So, you know, maybe we can talk about it in the discussion period. So I did then a quick survey of some of the main experimentalists working on metaphor, and indeed they overwhelmingly use predication cases as their stimuli. I won't go through all of these. It was quite fun checking out all the stimuli. I see lots of examples there, all predicates, predicates, predicates. I, I don't mean that um, referential cases were never there, but they were very uh, much less prevalent. Um, so coming a little bit more up to date, um, in Rubio Fernandez, for example, all her examples are predicate cases, John is a cactus, every lesson with a lullaby, um, Babimbini et al, this uh, sensicality test uh, that um, this group did, all, again, all the examples were predicate cases. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And early on, I should say, there was recognition of the special nature of metaphoric reference. So in his paper, Gibbs 1990 says, understanding the meaning of metaphorical referential descriptions, such as the cream puff didn't turn up for the fight. I'm assuming you're all familiar with the cream puff here, um, requires that an antecedent term or topic be located to provide the basis for metaphorical comparison, that the boxer is like a cream puff in such and such respects. For these reasons, he says, it's to be expected that subjects should take longer to read metaphorical referential descriptions than to comprehend literal descriptions of people, comparable literal descriptions of people. Uh, and in their paper, uh, Novik et al. say, there are at least two components to a full appreciation of metaphor. One is, and uh, I take it they mean here referential metaphor. One is detecting the referent of the metaphor, and the other is comprehending the additional effects, you know, something that tells the reader more about the author's or character's intention. So in their example, I've changed it from toads to tadpoles. Somehow that just feels better in English. Um, the tadpoles can get out of the pool now. Um, there's a reference assignment to the children and there's a metaphorical meaning, something like um, the fact that, that, that the children are being um, complimented as excellent young swimmers, as natural in the water and so on. In current relevance theory terms, we might um, talk about this as assigning a reference plus forming the ad hoc concept tadpoles star along with the accompanying implicatures and imagery and so forth. Now in predication cases, on the other hand, there is arguably just one component, which is grasping the intended meaning or effects. So just, um, I say just, but um, forming of the ad hoc concept tadpole star and the accompanying implicatures and imagery. <clears throat> so in effect, less work. Um, is it as simple as this then? That other things being equal, predicate metaphors are, no, are indeed no more costly than corresponding literals while referential metaphors are. They just, referential cases just require more pragmatic work. You've got to find the referent, which is the topic of the metaphor, as well as recover the metaphorical meaning or the, as people used to put it, the grounds for using the particular vehicle, tadpoles, for that referent. <clears throat> In um, a very helpful overview of uh, cognitive effort and effects in metaphor comprehension, looking at a huge range of different experimental findings. Gibbs and Tendahl in 2006 say, metaphorical referring expressions are a somewhat special form of metaphor. They're not representative of the kinds of metaphors studied in most linguistic and psycholinguistic studies. In fact, as mentioned above, many psycholinguistic studies show that metaphors can be processed as quickly or even more quickly than their so-called non-metaphorical equivalents. So as well as um, the main point made here, I want to pick up on this phrase in a minute, this phrase which I found quite interesting, the so-called non-metaphorical equivalents. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
So let's have a look at some of these literal equivalents used in the experiments. So in the metaphorical predication cases, the literal equivalents typically are things like the following. For you kids are little tadpoles, the equivalent is you kids are great little swimmers. Or that boxer is a cream puff, that boxer is flabby and soft. So here, the literal is in effect a paraphrase or a strongish implicature of the metaphorical use. Now, if we move to thinking about the metaphorical referring expressions and their so-called literal equivalents, well, you might expect the same sort of thing. So the tadpoles, referential, can get out now. The great young swimmers can get out now. The cream puff referential didn't show up, literal equivalent, the flabby fighter didn't show up. But in fact, you don't find that. I didn't find that when I went and looked at the literal equivalents used, the so-called literal equivalents used in the experiments. For the tadpoles can get out now, I found the children can get out now. For the cream puff didn't show up, I found the fighter didn't show up. So interestingly, the literal equivalents here do not involve any kind of literal paraphrase of the or, 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 or implic implicated meaning of the metaphors, unlike the predicate cases. Uh, so to try to get a clearer picture um, of this issue of how costly or effortful metaphor processing is, it occurred to me that it would be great to do an experiment that tests one and the same metaphor used referentially and predicatively with one and the same literal equivalents. And so this is what I started to think about. Um, and so the, the hypothesis was the following. Other things being equal, a metaphor used referentially takes more processing effort than the same metaphor takes when used predicatively. So it's you kids are tadpoles versus the tadpoles can get out now, can relax now. Um, and then uh, in this great search through the literature that I was doing, I came across this paper by Onishi and Murphy, 1993, way back. And I found, oh no, they've already done this in effect but only sort of, as it turned out. By the way, this is, a, this is a terrific paper, I think, and it's sort of strangely under-referenced. I came upon it by chance. Anyway, they, Onishi and Murphy, were following up on the Gibbs 1990 paper on referentially used metaphors. But they did, in addition, also compare referential and predicative uses of the same metaphors which I think is the key issue that is emerging from these disparate findings on the processing costs of metaphor. So first of all, they did two experiments, um, again, self-paced reading time measures following Gibbs's paradigm with contexts kept the same for each metaphorical literal pair, but they played around with these contexts a bit to, in, a, in a bid to overcome possible uh, issues in Gibbs's context that might explain the uh, findings of extra effort. So for example, they tried to make the reference very, very salient by placing it um, immediately before the target sentence. This made no difference. They got completely uh, consistent results with Gibbs uh, so that referential metaphors, here's one of theirs, my princess is hungry, referring to a cat, took, significantly longer to process or comprehend than the literal, my cat is hungry. Okay, so, so far no difference. And then in their third experiment, they did the thing that I, I was interested in doing myself, which is they used the same, they used the same metaphors predicatively. So that cat is my princess. <clears throat> and they understand, understood, sorry, these were understood just as quickly, just as easily as that cat is my favorite. So basically this was all in line with previous findings. 
But again, same point as I made a little earlier, consider the literal stimuli that they use, the so-called non-metaphorical equivalents used across referring and predicate cases. Uh, and let me say, you know, uh, this is not a criticism um, at all. It's incredibly difficult, as I found myself, to keep these literal equivalents uniform across referential and predicative conditions. And indeed, Anishi and Murphy did do this sometimes. So here's one case where uh, they succeed in doing this. So here's the predicative case. The, the clock, so this is about someone who didn't get up on time. Um, the clock was a crummy rooster metaphor. The clock was a crummy alarm, literal equivalent. Referential case, yeah, but the rooster didn't work. Yeah, but the alarm didn't work. Okay, great, completely parallel cases. But unfortunately, mostly they did not manage to do this. So in 17 out of their 20 cases, um, the literal equivalents were different in the predicate and the referential cases. And I would say in the referential cases, they were much, uh, shall we say, less rich in content. So in the predicate case, here we have, uh, this is one example, um, the predicate, uh, sorry, the metaphor putty, he is putty in front of third graders with the literal equivalent, he is a coward in front of third graders. The referential case, that putty couldn't stand up to a two-year-old with the literal, that teacher couldn't stand up to a two-year-old. So the way I would put this is that coward here is a kind of implicated emergent property of the metaphor putty in the context. And that's what's used as the literal equivalent in the predicate cases. Uh, but it's not used in the reference cases. Now, it seems clear that the use of teacher um, wouldn't have been successful as the literal equivalent in the predicate case, because that's already been established in the preceding context. So what we, that would have been uninformative, irrelevant, uh, pragmatically infelicitous, you might say. But the literal referential equivalent could have been. So it, it would have been perfectly OK to use that coward couldn't stand up to a two-year-old. And ideally, I think that's what should have happened. Uh, anyway, overwhelmingly, um, I found, I'm not going to read this slide, so um, you can if you want, but it's always hard to read when somebody's saying something else, so maybe don't bother. Um, what I found quite generally, and I at the time I thought perhaps quite crucially, the literal controls in the two conditions are simply not the same in the vast range of cases. Uh, and this is true in the Gibbs 1990 experiment and in the Novak et al. experiment that uh, the literal controls <clears throat> are, as it were, not in any way literal uh, paraphrases or overlapping in content with the metaphorical referring expressions. So just to take one example from the Novak et al. paper, the antecedent referent in the context was élève, pupils, the metaphorical reference, crapaud, toads, and the uh, literal uh, synonymous reference was enfant. Um, so uh, <clears throat> enfant um, was, of course, linked straight back to uh, the pupils uh, much more readily than crapaud. Um, it's worth pointing out that uh, to try to set up predicate cases using this kind of literal equivalent would tend to give something that was uninformative or irrelevant, pragmatically infelicitous. So um, if we used uh, enfant, uh, the children should get out of the pool now. That would have been, that's the uh, referential case. If we use that and said uh, the pupils are children, that would be pretty much uninformative. So there really is a difficulty here in uh, keeping these uh, uniform across predicate and referential cases. Okay, so I come now finally to this experiment that uh, Jin Jin Yan and I have um, very recently done. 
So our aim was to compare the cost of processing a metaphor used referentially relative to a literal equivalent to compare that with the cost of processing the same metaphor used predicatively relative to the same literal equivalent. So the, no the only novel thing here is that uh, we're using literal equivalents which are the same across referential and predicative uses and which have rich metaphor related content, unlike in the previous experiments on the referential cases. So one of our examples is the metaphor wilting violet and our literal equivalent is feeble woman. And we use both of these referentially and predicatively. So feeble woman is a kind of implicature, is a likely implicature, I would say, expressing an emergent property in the context of X is a wilting violet. You'd need to see the whole context to be convinced of that. Um, but I hope that's relatively plausible. So what were our expectations here or the hypothesis about um, processing effort? Well, it seemed to me that it could actually go either way. Either there really is something more effort demanding about referential uses of metaphor than predicate uses over and above the refer referring predicating distinction for literals, or now that the comparison is more controlled, that is the comparison is with, um, with the same literals across referring and predicating uses, the difference might disappear, or at least it might diminish. I think this is actually what I was hoping for. Okay, so here's an example of uh, one of our stimulus sets. Jane's, I'll just read it out quickly. Jane's neighbor, Ralph, didn't clean his flat very often, but when he did, he made an awful noise with his vacuum cleaner. It was very old and heavy and Ralph banged it against the walls. That Sunday morning when Ralph started cleaning, Jane said to herself, one of the following, here's the metaphorical referring expression. Oh no, the clanking tank is back in action. The literal referent, ref referring expression. Oh no, the noisy machine is back in action. Metaphorical predicate case. Oh, I hope he's quick. That vacuum cleaner is a clanking tank. And the uh, literal predication, I hope he's quick, that vacuum cleaner is a noisy machine. So we kept the context the same in all four of these conditions. The metaphors and the literal equivalents are the same across referring predicating pairs. And to the extent that it was possible, we kept the same number of syllables and words as uh, for the metaphoric literal pair actually haven't quite managed it in this particular example. Um, but I think we managed it well enough. Uh, in the referential cases, it was noticeable that um, there were a range of determiners. Sometimes we used the, as in the clanking tank. Sometimes we use that, sometimes our or my. Um, and I'm sure this makes a difference, but I don't know what difference it makes. And so for the time being, we just went for the intuitively most natural one of these. And this judgment of intuitive naturalness, comprehensibility uh, was made by six different people in total, including Jinjin and me, and certain adjustments were made uh, on the basis of people's judgments. <clears throat> Okay, here's a bunch of our other metaphors and their literal equivalents. So the wilting violet and the feeble woman, little tadpoles, super swimmers, air plant, unloved girl. Some people didn't like that one. Uh, cream puff, weak fighter, little hedgehog, spiky haired girl, and so on. All used uh, both referentially and predicatively. Okay, here's the method. Now, I don't know whether it's normal in a talk to lay this all out. Um, this just shows my inexperience perhaps, but I, so I will just zip through this. Uh, we had 22 UCL students as our participants, all native speakers of English. Uh, the materials and the design involved 12 of these stimulus sets of the four cases, each consisting of a single story context and each ending with one of the four sentence types as I've shown you. The four conditions were generated from the factorial manipulation of two factors, figurativeness and sentence structure, by which I mean referential or predicative. 
Four lists of stories were created, rotating the four experimental conditions in a Latin square design. Um, I barely know what I'm talking about here, by the way. Um, each list consisted of 12 experimental stimuli containing only one version of each set, plus 12 fillers in random combination. We use the same procedure as Gibbs, Anishi and Murphy, and Novak et al. Uh, first of all, participants read three practice stories, and then the 12 experimental and filler stories uh, in a random order. Stories are presented one line at a time by computer in a self-paced manner, and the participants' reading times for the target sentences were measured. Participants were instructed to read and fully understand each sentence before pressing the space bar to continue to the next sentence. Each story was followed by a simple comprehension question requiring a yes or no response, just to make sure that they were paying attention. Results. <clears throat> uh, certain bits of data had to be discarded in the normal kind of a way. Um, here are the mean reading times for the four types of target sentences. Metaphoric reference, 2,506 milliseconds. The literal ref referring expression sentences, 2,039. The metaphoric predications, 1,909. The literal predications, 2,023. The only significant result here being the difference between the, uh, well, the only obviously significant result being between the metaphoric reference and the literal reference cases. So carrying on with these results, um, and this is largely coming from Xinjin at this point, uh, a linear mixed effects model was used to examine the effect of figurativeness and structure on the reading times, treating both participants and items as random effects. The analysis revealed no overall effect of either figurativeness or structure, but a significant crossover interaction between these two factors with a p-value of 0 0.0073. So what this means, um, and I'm sure it's obvious to all of you, that neither it means that neither the factor of figurativeness nor of structure can explain the variances of the reaction times, but the effect of figurativeness on reaction times depends on the type of sentence structure and vice versa. And I think this um, is made nicely clear in these lovely graphs that Jinjin provided me with, both of which are effectively showing the same thing, um, but with in the left on the left hand side, the x-axis plots the two types of structure, predication and reference, and the right hand side uh, figurativeness on the x-axis. Uh, for me, the clearest one is the one the clearer one is the one on the left. So we can see pretty clearly here that um, the blue line, which plots the metaphorical cases, the reading times for the metaphorical cases, <clears throat> um, has this very pleasing uh, slope to it. Um, and I take it, well, I don't take it, I, I'm told that the y-axis here is the results of the, is what the linear mixed effects model tells us on the basis of the raw data that it was presented with. <clears throat> so our results, is that long enough, I hope, for you to look at this? Yeah, our results are broadly in line with the findings of all the other people there, that referential metaphors are significantly more costly to process than their literal equivalents. And even using our more contentful literal referring expressions, so things like the feeble woman or the noisy machine, doesn't seem to have diminished the difference in time or effort between the metaphorical references and the literal references, uh, which 
uh, the difference being essentially the same as was found in the earlier experiments listed there. So I guess this is a good thing. This is replication, which um, we like to see. Um, then importantly for me, as with the Onishi and Murphy results, the um, metaphor predicate counterparts is a wilting violet, is a clanking tank of the metaphor referring expressions took no longer to process than their equivalent literal predicates. In other words, in my sort of lay terms, the difference between the two differences is statistically significant, which seems to indicate that there is something especially demanding about metaphorical referring, taking us back to Ira's results. Okay, there were many limitations. I don't know what time, how much time I've got, probably none, um, Petra. Yeah, I think we have about 10 or 12 minutes for discussion. So um, maybe if oh. you can quickly wrap up. Okay, I will try to do that. So there are many limitations on um, this experiment. I won't go through them all. I think it would be good to do this in a much more, with much more fine grain techniques. This is my third point here, eye tracking ERP, um, which would home in more closely on the metaphorical phrases themselves and the corresponding literals, so like work done recently by Bambini's group and Petra. Um, I think there is really a major problem with uh, the contexts, what I'm calling the fixed context problem, the kind of context that makes a referential case reasonably natural, easy to grasp, tends to render the corresponding predicate case relatively uninformative and vice versa. Uh, perhaps we should rerun with a single um, referential sentence and a single predicate sentence, both of which are interpretable literally or metaphorically, but with two different contexts for each one bias to the literal, the other to the metaphorical. So something like Gehrig's the winter wind tossed the lacy blanket kind of case. This might get round these, uh, the difficulty of creating these stimuli. Then there's an interesting challenge, which I uh, came across also in um, delving around in the literature coming from Stuart and Heredia. I think that's how you say it. They tested spoken referential metaphorical uses and seem to find that they are just as easily, just as quickly understood as spoken literal referential uses. Uh -huh. So this is completely different from what we've found with all the stimuli so we've been discussing so far, which have been written cases. They point to the role of prosody, obviously. Um, maybe as speakers, we realize that our listeners need extra cues um, when we're using um, a metaphorical uh, referring expression. Um, and I think there's a, a broader issue here, which I've seen coming up in other discussions, um, in other conferences, experimental conferences, a general issue of controlled lab conditions, unnatural in so many respects, but essential as well to isolate um, particular factors. Um, the issue of that versus ecological validity, because in, of course, in actual face-to-face -face situations of referring, we're using not just expressive prosody, but also eye gaze, nods, points, and other facial bodily gestures to indicate our intended referent. Now, um, the last few slides, and I'll just try to summarize them rather than go through them in detail, uh, try to come to grips a little bit with why metaphorical referring is special, difficult, um, effort demanding. And there's actually a really interesting little discussion of this by a philosopher of language, Joseph Stern, in his book, because he is troubled by the fact that his semi-formal account of how metaphor works, a sort of semantic account, runs into problems with these kinds of referring expressions. The sun is furious, metaphorically referring to Achilles. And so just going halfway down this slide then, he proposes a number of possible solutions, one of which rests on the assertion presupposition distinction. So he says, in uttering the sun is furious, I'm presupposing that there exists a unique thing that has the properties of the sun metaphorically understood in the context. And I'm asserting that that thing is furious. So both of these are communicated, this presupposition 
about the existence of a thing with these properties, um, <clears throat> such that the hearer has to accommodate this presupposition, has to add it to the context, as well as recover the intended referent. And so he concludes, well, predicate metaphors just are the more basic construction in terms of which the other one, the referential one, has to be explained. Um, so that's just a little hint in the direction of why metaphorical referring might be difficult. Um, whether this has a direct uh, correlation in processing is something uh, which has yet to be determined, I think. Okay, so I, I will stop there. I just want to say as my very last word that um, uh, another, well, first of all, I want to thank my, um, my co-author here, Jin Jin Yan, um, for all her hard work. And I want to, again, uh, acknowledge, thank Ira very much for the inspiration that I got from his paper, which led to me exploring this in this kind of detail. Thank you.